In this series, where I discuss the work of prominent New Zealand politicians, I've only really discussed various party leaders in New Zealand Parliament, but today I want to discuss a former MP who was never a party leader, yet was very influential and who has had a very interesting career. Who I'm talking about is Shane Jones. He was nicknamed Jonesy. He served four terms in New Zealand Parliament, being a minister multiple times, swapping parties, and never being a stranger to controversy. I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. We have the most enormous big gay rainbow across my electorate. They're not going to win an election. Let's keep moving! Born in Northland, Shane Jones was a married descendant of the Tiapanui and Nyadakoto Iwis. He was actually named after the 50s western movie of the same name. Before his parliamentary career, he had a substantial career in public life. When the Ministry of the Environment was created in 1986 by the then Prime Minister Geoffrey Palmer, Jones was a prominent public servant who helped create a sector of the ministry called the Maori Policy Unit. Now in the late 80s and early 90s, there were calls for fishing rights to be restored to Maori, who had claims to the fisheries of New Zealand through the Treaty of Waitangi, the founding document of New Zealand. In 1992, the Sea Lord deal was reached between the government and Iwi of New Zealand, which gave a $120 million investment into giving commercial fishing rights back to Iwi, allowing Iwi to purchase 50% shares in Sea Lord Products Limited, the largest fishing company in New Zealand. The deal also secured rights to 20% of commercial fishing quota. This entire investment was run by the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Commission. Shane Jones was appointed to this commission, and by 1993, he was the chairman of the commission. <laughs> As a consequence of Mr. Bolger having confidence and faith in me, I became a member of the Fisheries Commission. I rose to the level of chairing, sir, Sea Lords, the Māori Fisheries Commission, a host of other entities, participated, sir, in selling Salmon Smith Biolab and delivering seafood assets back to the Chatham Islands and our Māori people, and I became a pro industry man. It was evident that Shane Jones cared about his heritage and his people and worked hard to fight on their behalf. A man like that can't go long without aspirations of elected office knocking at his door. In 2005, Prime Minister Helen Clark convinced him that it was time for him to enter the world of politics. And Helen Clark, sir, the woman who, after a meeting in Charles Waldegrave's house with Mike Williams, enticed me into politics. Shane Jones says that he was convinced to join Clark's Labour Party after hearing the National Party leader Don Brash give a speech claiming that Maori had more rights under New Zealand law than white people. In this country, it should not matter what colour you are or what your ethnic origin might be. There has been a divisive trend to embody racial distinctions into large parts of our legislation. Jonesy ran for the Northland electorate seat, a seat that Labour had never been competitive in, a seat which had a very popular national incumbent, John Carter, a man so popular in that area that to this day, at age 71, he holds political office, now being the mayor of the far north. It was not likely that Shane Jones was going to oust his national opponent, but not to worry. If he didn't win this electorate seat, he could still get into Parliament through the party vote, through the benefits of the NMP voting system. Shane Jones was ranked 27th on the party list, the highest Labour candidate on the list that didn't currently hold office. He was actually ranked 
rank higher than many Labour incumbent members of Parliament. That's how keen Helen Clark was on having Shane Jones in Parliament. So the election came around and the seats in Parliament looked as follows. Labour with 50 seats, National with 48, New Zealand First with 7, Greens with 6, Maori with 4, United Future with 3, Act with 2, and the Progressive Party with 1. The 2005 election being famous for having the most party diversity in Parliament in New Zealand's history. As expected, Shane Jones lost his electorate seat to John Carter. I knew then, sir, with scientific clarity, John Carter had that seat for life. <laughs> but gained a seat in Parliament through the party list. Through various agreements between parties, Helen Clark stayed on as Prime Minister and gave Jonesy the prominent position of being the Chairman of the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee. His first term as MP was exciting, him becoming well known even for being a junior MP. His blazant defence of the Maori community was evident, especially with the fact that he constantly spoke to Rao on the floor of Parliament. At this time, there was a clear rift in the Labour Party, one camp being filled with the more classically liberal MPs, MPs who fought for workers' rights, and the other camp that was becoming more and more liberal, fighting for LGBT rights, fighting against climate change, and many other things of the like. It was clear that Jonesy was a member of the old-school union-loving Labour Party, at a time when it was transitioning to becoming more and more progressive. He seemed to butt heads with many of his Labour colleagues, but made friends with colleagues who were more politically and culturally aligned with him, even making friends across party lines. In 2007, ahead of the 2008 election, Helen Clark did a massive reshuffle in her cabinet, which included getting Shane Jones his first ministerial positions, becoming the Minister of Building and Construction, as well as Associate Minister in charge of Treaty Negotiations, Immigration and trade. These appointments showed that he was climbing the party ranks, becoming more prominent and well-known within the party. For the next election, he was pushed up the party list to become number 16. The 2008 election wasn't good for the Labour Party though. National with a new leader, John Key, won this election. But Jones retained his seat, even though he lost his electorate race yet again. John Carter had that seat for life. This election cycle wasn't too great for Jonesy, as an embarrassing scandal emerged from when he was a cabinet minister. In 2010, John Key's government released the ministerial credit card details of all ministers dating back to 2003. This showed how many ministers had misspent government money on flights, food, wine, and many other things. But the most embarrassing is the fact that in addition to the $6,000 that Jonesy misspent, he also rented pornography on the government credit card while he was away on ministerial business. Oh. Jones repaid all the money before he had left as a minister, but he was still dragged through the media over the situation anyway. Shane Jones was re-elected in 2011. He actually changed electorates this time, and ran in the Maori electorate of Tamaki Makora against the popular Maori leader, Peter Sharples. Jonesy got a lot closer to winning the seat, only losing by 936 votes, but he was still number 16 on the party list and stayed in parliament. John Key stayed on as prime minister as National had the largest share of the vote. And yet again, Shane Jones was involved in another scandal. Chinese millionaire businessman, Yongming Yang, was charged with making false declarations on his immigration papers, as it was suspected that he did not reach the criteria into entering the country. Yet he was allowed to enter the country and even become a citizen by the Helen Clark government in 2008. And who was in charge of immigration at that time? Oh yeah, our friend Jonesy. Uh oh. While this investigation was going on, Shane Jones was stripped of all of his profiles as a member of the shadow government and was demoted from his front bench status. But shortly after, Yang was found not guilty of all charges and Jones was exonerated. He oranga ngako mo Shane Jones, kāringa hāmine tini hanga pūtea erima i uhia rā ki runge i te haina mana kai pakehi, ko ia i ngā ngutu o te ao tōranga pū i ngā rā nei mo te āhua o tana urunga mai ki tēnei whenua, i whakamana ti ake i roto i te kōti. I haria a William Yen, he maha hoki ona ingoa anō, ki roto i te kōti i raro i te whakapai, i rūkahu ia i runge i tana tono uru mai ki tēnei whenua. Nā, he tono tērā i whakaiti arā e te minita o tau awa arā e Shane Jones o Reipa. Hei tā te kōti teitei a hakoa te pai o te karauna ki te kimi kōrero hei tautoko i te whakapai, kei reira tonu ngā maramara kū raku raku e takotoana. Wā, ko hiki tia te tai maha i runga i a hau. O ti rā tāria te wā nā te mei, tini hanga tia i whakaparungia tōku ingoa mai e tahe o ngā āpiha o te kāwana. Since Helen Clark left the party, Labour had struggled to find a good replacement leader for the party. They tried Phil Goth and then David Scherer. Neither could hold a candle to the charismatic leadership of Nationals John Key. So a year out from the next election, David Scherer stepped down as leader, and Labour tried to find a new party leader. 
Labour had decided, in hopes to excite their base, they would have an American-style open selection process to find their party's new leader. So they developed this voting system. 40% of the vote will be shared evenly between the party's 34 sitting MPs. 40% will be given to the paying party members who could vote for their favourite candidate to become leader. And 20% will be split between various unions as union members were a big voting base for Labour. This selection process was heavily criticised. It was said that giving unions 20% was giving too much power to union leadership. And this system also made it possible for the majority of MPs in the party to vote for a guy who doesn't even become the leader, creating a divided party. Oh, they're absolutely appalling. <laughs> appalling why? Oh, why they're appalling? That's exactly what will happen in the <coughs> British situ situation, where in fact the MPs who know one another all said there should be one candidate, and the unions have foisted on a different uh, leader onto the parliamentary party. He doesn't have their confidence. Two contenders emerged, David Scherer's deputy leader Grant Robertson and David Cuntliffe, who was a prominent member of the party who had been suspected to become the leader instead of David Scherer the last time they looked for a new leader. But there was a lot of commotion at the time about how neither of these candidates were Māori. Labour had comfortably received a majority of Māori support for decades, yet they had never had a Māori leader. This was criticised for years, but many thought that now was the time for it to happen. Tikina Māori have been supporting Labour for 80 years. Mm. Yeah. The, whoever the next leader is, I think, is going to be the 15th Labour leader. Never been a Māori leader. So, of course, it's well over time. In fact, statistically, we should have had, should have had a couple already. Oh, well, we I think that it is time for a Māori leader. Um, Māori have always wanted that. There's been huge loyalty uh, to that party. We've had you, a, you've yeah. been backing Shane Jones, haven't well, you? I, I, well, I don't know if I've been backing Jane Jones. I back... Of uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right, <laughs> Johnson. But we, we, we want to see ourselves reflected in there. So we have, we've had great brown hopes. John failed us miserably, unfortunately. But, you know, he's doing well now. But, but no, seriously... You, you know, this party has been walking over Māori for some years now. They need to, they need to give a sign to Māori. Jones, if he does come back, which is, is an outside bet, be a miracle for, if he comes back, but Māori would love it out on the street. So our friend, Jonesy, stepped up as candidate. These three men went through debates and conferences and campaigning to become the new leader of the party. Shane Jones looked like he was the underdog, not expected to win, but he spoke with such gusto and determination, claiming to speak for the disenfranchised New Zealander, who never come out to vote. When I go to the regions of New Zealand, I struggle to find, in the malaise, in the workplaces, in the hotels, in the RSAs, Loud voices saying, Jonesy, the first waka of choice politically for us is Labour. But their economic circumstances mean they should be Labour. Their dreams for their kids in terms of mobility means they should be Labour. So I ask myself, as a Labour MP since 2005, why are those people not naturally choosing the red waka as the canoe, the vessel that addresses their mobility concerns, their equity concerns, and also their concerns of pride and self-belief. And that's why I'm standing, because I genuinely believe that not only am I an embodiment of old New Zealand, as a consequence of education, and my style of operation, I can enable us to be the party of New New Zealand as well. In the end, Shane Jones came in third place in all three categories. We had our leadership contest. Probably the most liberating thing I personally did as a member of the Labour Party. The ability to be paid and wander around for six weeks saying whatever I liked <laughs> about whoever I liked in my own party, sir, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I have to accept there are more people coming to my do at the backbencher in the Labour Party than bloody well voted for me during that contest. 
and David Cunliffe was elected as the new leader of the party. This actually had the effect that people were worried about, when more of the Labour MPs wanted Robertson to become the leader, with Cunliffe leading a divided party. On the 22nd of April, 2014, months before the election, Shane Jones announced that he was going to retire and not run for re-election. In his extremely entertaining valedictory speech, he outlined his life in Parliament, his many controversies, and what he thinks his legacy would be. And that's, sir, when I began working for Sir Geoffrey Palmer, who said to me, Jones, Jones, read Little Heart, Little Heart. I went and consulted Little Heart, sir. It's a book on the history of the First World War where, sir, the members of the battalion have been gassed by their own troops. They've been strafed by their own planes. They've been shot upon as a consequence of friendly fire. Adequate preparation for the Labour Party politics. <laughs> when John Key, in a fit of enthusiasm, decided that all credit card receipts should be made available to the public. <laughs> the uh, Parliament now is dishing out credit cards. I understand they're called purchase cards. Calvin, know this from me. Cash is king, brother. Cash is king. <laughs> while I was the Minister of Building was that I freed the building profession, I freed the community and the economy from the wretchedness of the Building Act and you can now, sir, build a 10 square metre shed without a building permit. I wasn't to know that the current Minister would regard that as housing policy for South Auckland. And I want to ask you, sir, how come a lot of the Chinese fellows who get to know politicians have got the name Liu? Kia ora, Morris. <laughs> In my case, sir, the media spelt the, name's man, the, the, the name of the man L-I-U. The political alphabet of the Labour Party spelt his name L-O-O. Because, sir, that's where my political reputation ended up for a period of time. He also mentions how the Labour Party has become unrecognisable to him, seeing how he believes he is more in line politically with former members of the party, opposed to the current membership. Well, sir, the notion that the people who should come to see me at my valedictory is Willie Jackson, John Tamihere, Mr. Preble, Mr. Douglas, Ron Mark is a comment on perhaps the nature of my politics as a member of this side of the House. <laughs> Willie Jackson, the Māori equivalent of Pam Corkery. <laughs> John Tamihere, sir, Labour's number one exile. <laughs> and sir, the two gentlemen who belong to that generation of Labour politicians in the day, and they are part of the legacy of the party that I do belong to, sir. The Labour Party had become too liberal for him to stick around. He got a standing ovation in the House for his final speech, even from politicians and other parties. Please, sing me the Waiata, please release me, let me go. I salute you. You've honoured me by turning out today. Please, come and enjoy the oysters, the clams, the fish, etc. over at the back bencher. This is me. I'm out. Kia ora tātou katoa. Kia ora. This is how much Shane Jones' personality and way of doing politics will be missed in Parliament. Before his speech, he had a little chat with his personal friend from the Mana Party, Hone Harawero. And uh oh, they left their mics on. You know it's going to be passionate, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I wonder what they were talking about. <laughs> Winston? Yes folks, that is THE Winston Peters, multiple time kingmaker and leader of the New Zealand First Party. What was going on with this discussion about Winston Peters? Was Shane Jones seriously considering joining the New Zealand First Party for the 2017 election? There's been a lot of idle jotting and scribbling about myself and Winston Peters, sir. Largely driven by troublemakers from the other side of the house. <laughs> well, never mind that, because the national government offered Shane Jones a position as the economic advisor of the Pacific. And that's what Jonesy did, becoming a representative for the New Zealand government in the Pacific Islands, giving aid to their governments and their communities. In the 2014 election, John Key won re-election, staying on as Prime Minister, but Jonesy didn't seem to pay much mind to that. Politics was behind him, and he was in a new job. 
Hey, kano hi mo te kawana tanga? Oh, well, I understand he's been an uh, effective ambassador in the Pacific. Well, that new job didn't last too long, and he left the position in 2017, months before the next election. And there started to be a lot of speculation. Was the statement about him joining New Zealand first true? Angai mo ao te aroa ki te mona nui aki wa. Nā kona nō hoki e rere toki toki nei te heitara, ka tua Jones ma ao te aroa tua tahi hei te kōwhiringa pōti o te motu. Ski tete hi hui mo te ropu ao te aroa tua tahi i te marama o hui tāngaru. Ke tātou katoa he hātoua munara. Kia hatia nō te ahiahi nei i mana ai i a Shane Jones tana hokinga ke anō. The whole town's talking about the Jones boy. Most importantly, all of you coming out today to enable me to own up to the worst kept secret. New Zealand First had always been a platform for the populist founder of the party, Winston Peters. No one else in the party being very well known or loved. At this time, Winston Peters was pushing 70 years old, with no clear successor in the party. So once Winston died, so too would the party. This move to allow Jonesy into the party seemed to be a move to reinvigorate the party and give it a fighting chance to live on past Winston. Like Winston Peters, Shane Jones was a smart-talking man of the people from the North, pushing for populist policies and overall being very charismatic and likeable. Shane Jones ran in the Whangarei electorate, as he couldn't run in his usual Northland electorate because Winston Peters was actually the Northland electorate MP. After winning a by-election, back in 2015. So Winston would be defending that seat in the 2017 election. Shane Jones wasn't pulling well in Whangarei and was not expected to win. Luckily, he'd been placed eighth on the party list, a position higher than multiple incumbent New Zealand First MPs. The New Zealand First candidate, Shane Jones, is delighted that he's been ranked number eight on the party list, saying he was always utterly confident his quality would shine through. But I love the number eight. It's Chinese for good luck. Did you think you'd be a bit higher at the list though? Look, I never ever once um, lobbied either um, uh, Winston. I never contacted a single board member about uh, the rankings. I was just utterly confident that um, I'm a performer and quality would shine through. They really wanted to get Jonesy in, but some people made fun of Shane Jones for accepting this position of eighth on the party list. Eighth, eighth. Eighth on the list. That's a bit of a kick in the guts, isn't it? I mean, you must have been pretty pissed off when you saw that. Um... Especially since he had a bigger political profile than most New Zealand First MPs, being a three-time MP and former cabinet minister. Also being eighth on the list did not guarantee him a seat in parliament, as New Zealand First had gone less than eight MPs in the past before. Jonesy was actually part of this multi-party debate, representing his new party, New Zealand First. His charm and wit made everyone laugh and he made his case to New Zealand. Election day rolled around and New Zealand First received nine seats in parliament, letting Shane Jones take a seat in parliament based on the party vote. He came in a distant third place as expected in his electorate. The 20 the 2017 election was very tight for the top two parties, requiring a coalition deal to be made between parties to reach 50% of the seat count to have a governable majority. This gave New Zealand First a leverage, as it has had twice before in the past. As the Green Party refused to form a coalition with the National Party, the ACT Party was too small to affect any coalition dealings, and the two big parties refused to work together. So this allowed New Zealand First to decide who the Prime Minister would be, be it Bill English from the National Party or Jacinda Ardern from the Labour Party. This led to a month of closed-door negotiations between the New New Zealand First Party and National and Labour separately, but eventually New Zealand First chose to make Labour's Jacinda Ardern Prime Minister. This coalition deal involved many policy concessions for New Zealand First, as well as various cabinet positions, which included many positions for Shane Jones, the only member of the party other than Winston Peters who had ministerial experience. Shane Jones became the Minister of Infrastructure, Minister of Forestry, and the Minister of Regional Economic Development. These were massive profiles, making him one of the most powerful people in New Zealand government. A big thing that he was in charge of is a $3 billion regional growth fund, a scheme designed to create economic prosperity within regional areas of the country. There are conflicting views on the actual success of this fund, whether it was actually good investment into economically depressed areas of the country, or if it was just a slush fund designed to buy votes for New Zealand First and the Labour Party in these rural areas. Regardless, it would be unfair to say that it wasn't fun to have Jonesy back in Parliament, who has such a great aura around him. He emits such charm and charisma that just makes everyone laugh. I would remind the member that the word booty has multiple meanings. A part of my pucker papa is belonging to a pirate. <laughs> Not unlike his boss, Winston Peters. His government has banned oil and gas exploration as well as mining on conservation land. This government has not banned uh, oil and gas exploration. And whatever that industry is called, whatever that industry called mining is, I'm having difficulty trying to understand it. <laughs> 
Shane Jones also pushed for an agenda for a work for the doll scheme, a policy which would force people on the unemployment benefit to go back to work. The scheme didn't really go anywhere, but he was very outspoken for this policy, calling out neats on the unemployment benefit, or as he put it, But read my lips. I'm sick and tired of watching the ne'er-do-well nefs sitting on the couch doing nothing, and I as a Māori politician and a Māori leader, I'm not going to tolerate it any longer. His time as a New Zealand First Minister did seem to have him take after his boss Winston more and more, getting him in hot water after calling for a maximum population and criticising Indian students coming into the country. We should debate it and there should be a mandate rather than opening up the uh, options unfettered and everyone comes here from New Delhi. I don't like that idea at all. You don't like the people coming from New Delhi? Oh no, I think that uh, the number of students that have come from India uh, have ruined um, many of those uh, institutions. This type of rhetoric isn't new for New Zealand First, but it does seem to be evidence of Shane Jones becoming more and more like Winston Peters, possibly as a way to transition himself to be the successor to Winston, opposed to other established New Zealand First MPs like Tracy Martin, Rod Mark, and Fletcher Taputu. As the 2020 election loomed, New Zealand First polling showed them around 3%, not enough to hit the 5% threshold to make it into Parliament. Without some turnaround, they would not get any seats in Parliament. A possible way to keep their seats would be through the coattailing rule, which states that a party can forego the 5% threshold if they win at least one electorate seat. The most feasible electorate for them to win was the Northland electorate, which Winston had won back in 2015. But as Winston had lost that electorate seat in 2017, the party turned to Shane Jones, the second most prominent member of the party and former candidate for that electorate. This became Jonesy's time to shine. If he won that electorate and saved the New Zealand First Party from destruction, he would be the clear successor once Winston retired. Shane Jones was even promoted to fourth on the party list, submitting himself into leadership of the party. But as per usual, Shane Jones did not poll well in the Northland electorate. Just like every other time he ran in that electorate, he even made a statement saying that the survival of the New Zealand First Party cannot be counted on him winning Northland. Ouch. Luckily, Winston had beaten the odds before, and he was adamant that the polls were all wrong and New Zealand First would be back into Parliament. But the election came around, and New Zealand First only received 2.6% of the vote, the worst showing in the party's history. Uh oh Shane Jones came in an expected third place in Northland. A terrible showing. The worst showing he's actually ever had in that Northland electorate. That was it for New Zealand First. They were out. And so was Shane Jones, whose comeback was very short-lived. He had a very exciting and scandal-filled career in New Zealand politics. His fun mannerisms and comedy will be missed in the halls of Parliament. Actually, some breaking news right now. While I was working on this video, it turns out that New Zealand First isn't giving up. They've just recently announced that they're going to be running again in 2023, with Winston Peters as the leader of the party, and Shane Jones still being a member of the party. This is a little unexpected, frankly, as I thought maybe they were done for good, so we'll just have to see if there's another gust of wind in the careers of Winston Peters and Shane Jones, the two wise-talking populists from the North. My gut feeling is they're not going to make it back in in the 2023 election, but I guess only time will tell.